Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, we are going to be discussing erythrocytes as a part of our hematology lecture series. Okay, let's get started. So let's talk about the production of red blood cells, so how they're made. So the term erythropoiesis is important to know uh, within this lecture, and erythropoiesis is the production of erythrocytes. And we already know that erythrocytes is a fancy term for red blood cells. So erythropoiesis is the production of new red blood cells. So every second, actually, the human body produces 2 million red blood cells within the bone marrow. It's actually a lot, 2 million every single second. So this is a complex process that starts, of course, in the bone marrow uh, with a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell and then ends in a mature erythrocyte. So there's a hormone uh, that controls this, and it's called erythropoietin, uh, shortened as EPO. And erythropoietin is produced mainly by the kidney uh, in response to hypoxia, which is falling levels of oxygen within the body. Uh, the kidney actually secretes uh, this EPO, which in turn tells the body to increase the amount of red blood cells that it produces. So the production of red blood cells is directly related to the amount of EPO that's being secreted by the kidneys. So red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen to tissues. So if the body's oxygen begins to decrease, that hypoxia is gonna trigger the production of EPO and in turn, the production of red blood cells. So in addition to red blood cell production, EPO also helps to increase the number of cells produced per division increases the permeability of the bone marrow sinus and also increases the transfer of iron between precursors to red blood cells. So again, like we discussed on the previous slide, every single second the body is generating just a ton of red blood cells. Erythropoiesis begins with the differentiation of the multipotential hematopoietic stem cell. And the first step of this is becoming a BFUE or burst forming unit erythroid, and then a CFUE or a colony forming unit erythroid, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides here. So the hematopoietic stem cell differentiates into a more committed erythroid progenitor uh, by becoming a burst forming unit erythroid. So this is also called a BFUE. And BFUE are the first progenitor cells committed solely to the erythroid lineage. So what this means is that they are the first cells that have made up their mind and say, yep, we're going to become a red blood cell or an erythrocyte. The BFUEs have a low level of receptors for EPO, uh, but do help to maintain the cell cycle. We had a hematopoietic stem cell, of course, that becomes that BFUE. So now the BFUE further differentiates into a colony forming unit erythroid, also called a CFUE. So there's a high concentration of EPO levels present and that EPO then transforms the CFUE into something called a pronormoblast. Now the pronormoblast is the earliest recognizable erythroid precursor cell. So this is the first cell that we can see with our microscope. So again, as a recap here, erythropoiesis is the process of maintaining the population of red blood cells in the peripheral bloodstream. So you do need to know the developmental stages from youngest to oldest in the erythroid cell line, which are listed here. So we have a stem cell. Uh, let's, let me get my, my pointer here. So we have a stem cell here. Um, then it becomes a uh, so a myeloid stem. So myeloid uh, means that it's going to become either a red blood cell or a um, neutrophil or an eosinophil, basically everything except for a lymphocyte. So myeloid means that. And then if, it, if it's a lymphoid stem cell, that means it's going to become a lymphocyte. So we have these, the stem cell here. Then we have the BFUE and then the CFUE. Then we have pronormoblast. So again, this is the first uh, uh, recognizable cell within this uh, lineage. And then it becomes a basophilic normoblast. 
then a polychromatic normoblast, then an orthochromic normoblast, then a polychromatic erythrocyte, and then of course it becomes lastly the erythrocyte, which is a mature uh, red blood cells. Uh, red blood cell. So, and we'll look at each of these morphologically identifiable stages uh, here momentarily. Uh, but at first, there are a few things that we need to talk about before we get into that. So, from the pronormoblast stage to the mature erythrocyte stage, you'll notice a few key, few key things. So, again, the pronormoblast is an erythroblast, meaning it's a baby red blood cell, and it's the first identifiable red blood cell precursor. So baby cells are different from baby humans or baby animals. So when baby humans or, or animals are born, they're small, right? And then they grow larger as they age. So it's actually not that way for blood cells. So baby blood cells start off large and then gradually decrease in size as they age and mature. As the red blood cells mature, their chromatin in their nucleus begins to condense as well. And when they're fully mature, their nucleus just expels right out of the cell. So um, also a key thing to, to know here is when I'm talking about baby cells, I'm not talking about like human baby cells. I'm just talking about the cells that are just produced. So the immature cells. So the most immature cells are going to be the larger cells. And as, it, as they mature, they're going to start condensing and getting smaller. So let's look at pictures of these cells on the next slide here. So this is a great picture representation of the maturation process of the red blood cell. And yes, you do need to know their names and also be able to identify them by their appearance. So the first two cells here, this is an early pronormoblast and a pronormoblast. Um, uh, these are, um, of course, pronormoblasts. And uh, that means that they are blast cells. So um, I'll say it in this presentation and I'll say it in every cell presentation, probably in every laboratory that we have together. All the cells we will discuss in this class are red blood cells and white blood cells. They have their own type of blast cells. So for example, red blood cells have the pronormoblasts or also called erythroblasts. Lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cell, have lymphoblasts. Neutrophils have myeloblasts. So think of the term blast to mean a baby cell. And I don't mean baby cells as in like uh, what an infant would have. I'm talking about baby cells as in immature cells. So all of these cells have blast forms. So you do not uh, have to look at a blast and be able to differentiate it between let's say an erythroblast and a lymphoblast. You just need to be able to classify it as a blast. And uh, just as for full disclosure, I'm talking to uh, MLT and MLS students. You don't need to identify, you know, a, a, an erythroblast versus a lymphoblast. You just need, this is a blast and it needs to go to a pathologist. So there is a way that we can classify blasts uh, via something called flow cytometry. Uh, but this is not something that you would uh, be expected to do if you were working in hematology, uh, just looking at them under a microscope. So again, this, this is a really great pictorial representation of the red blood cell maturation process. So, um, so we have early pronormoblasts, pronormoblasts, then basophilic normoblasts, polychromatophilic normoblasts, early orthochromic normoblasts, and here's an, an, another orthochromic normoblast, reticulocyte, and normal red blood cells. So take a second to look at these and tell me kind of what you are thinking about how these cells are different, you know? So, Take a look most specifically at the nucleus. So for example, this is the nucleus of the basophilic normoblast. And this is the nucleus of the orthochromic normoblast. Okay, so what's different there? So as you can see, um, the baby cells or the blast cells are very large in comparison to you know, the, all of these, the orthochromic normoblast and the, the normal red blood cell. Um, so again, blast cells, and, and the more immature a, a blood cell is, the larger it's going to be in this maturation cycle. So that's another thing. So it, it's going to decrease in size as it matures. And then another thing that you need to note here is look at the size of the nucleus. So look at this nucleus versus this nucleus. What's happening there? So the basophilic normoblast and the normal or the pronormoblast, so they have pretty large nucleus. Um, in them, and then you can see it's starting to get smaller and smaller as it progresses. So um, that's another thing that's going to happen in the maturation process of this particular uh, cell line is the nucleus is going to get smaller. So the cell overall is going to get smaller and then also the nucleus is going to get smaller. 
Now take a look at the reticulocyte and the normal red blood cell. So what's missing there? That's the nucleus. The nucleus is missing. So what happened to it? So for red blood cells, um, as, it, as the red blood cell matures, uh, again, the nucleus is going to get smaller, and eventually what's going to happen is this nucleus is just going to expel right out of the cell. So reticulocytes and, and normal mature red blood cells do not have a nucleus, um, and uh, that is uh, just the process um, that happens in red blood cells. So notice here, we're going to talk about these cells individually, um, but notice here the reticulocyte uh, and the normal red blood cell look very similar to each other. Uh, the only difference really is the reticulocyte um, is a little bit uh, larger, just slightly larger than the normal red blood cell. And you can tell it kind of has like a little bit of a different color than the normal red blood cell. Um, so uh, retics, we call them. Um, these are, um, if you see them in the blood, and again, we'll talk about this, but if you see them actually in the blood, it's called uh, polychromasia. So that's just something to note here as we talk, as we go through this presentation, uh, you'll hear more about it. The pronormoblast or rubroblast, or even the proerythroblast, is the earliest recognizable erythrocyte precursor. So what this means is that this is the first cell in the red blood cell lineage that is identifiable. So this is a newborn red blood cell, a baby red blood cell. It accounts for less than 1% of all cells that are present within the bone marrow. There's a high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, so around 80% of this entire cell is nucleus. Uh, you can um, also sometimes see faint nucleoli. Um, these cells can have one to three nucleoli in them. I don't really see any that are distinct in this particular cell pictured here, uh, but you will often see them in uh, blast cells and they appear as faint little circles uh, within the nucleus. So sometimes like this might be one here, but yeah, they're like, they just appear as faint little circles that you can see in uh, the nucleus material. So these cells spend around five to seven days uh, within the bone marrow mature, and then they go into the peripheral blood at the reticulocyte stage. So you can see uh, that these cells have a very deep blue cytoplasm without any granules. So the cytoplasm is, is here. Let's see. So all of this is the cytoplasm. Right. So you can see in this particular cell, um, it's a very, very deep, uh, blue cytoplasm, and there's no granules in there, of course. Uh, it stains very intensely. Uh, so these are very large cells, um, up to 20 micromoles in size. So the next stage of red blood cell maturation is the basophilic normoblast. These can also be referred to as basophilic erythroblasts or prorubrocytes. They're very similar to the pronormoblasts, but um, they are smaller and the nucleus is about, uh, takes up about 75% of the entire cell. So these cells account for about 1-3% to of the total number of cells uh, in the bone marrow. Uh, nucleoli are generally not observed in these cells, uh, but there can be up to one of them present. So these cells, again, are smaller uh, than their precursors. They're about um, up to 16 micromoles in size, and you can see here that the cytoplasm is less blue than that of the pronormoblast. So let's, so here in this circle, this is the nucleus, and everything on the outside is the cytoplasm. So you can see it's a little bit lighter blue uh, than the pronormoblast. The next uh, cell in the red blood cell maturation process is the polychromatic normoblast, which is also called a polychromatic erythroblast or rubrocyte. So these account for about 13 to 30 percent of all the cells that are present within the bone marrow. And as you can see from this photo here, there's a decreased nucleus to cytoplasm ratio and there are no nucleoli present. These cells can be up to 12 micromoles in size and there's abundant gray-blue cytoplasm. And this gray-blue color of the cytoplasm is because the cell at this stage is beginning to produce hemoglobin. So I remember red blood cells have hemoglobin in them. This is the stage where hemoglobin starts to be being produced. So again, this is the nucleus here, and everything else is the cytoplasm. You can see a distinct color change uh, between this and its precursors. 
next cell in the process is called the orthochromic normoblast, or also the orthochromic erythroblast, or even the metarubrocyte. There's lots of names for this. I don't know why they can't just pick one and go with it. Uh, they make it much more complicated, but those are the names for it. They account for around 5 to 10 percent of all the cells within the bone marrow, and they have a low nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. Uh, so they are uh, about, well, they can be up to 10 micromoles in size. Um, and it's not uncommon to see these cells in the peripheral blood of newborn babies, um, usually caused from the stress of being born. Now, if we see these in the peripheral blood, uh, we refer to them as nucleated red blood cells or nucleated reds. And of course, since lab professionals really just love abbreviating uh, things, they can also just be called NRBCs. So NRBCs, or nucleated reds, um, have an eccentric or partially extruded nucleus in them. And you can see from this picture here, the nucleus is super round and dark, which is right here. Okay, so that's the nucleus. It's super round and dark, and it's off to one side of the cell. So I've noticed that students oftentimes get these confused with lymphs or lymphocytes. And um, my recommendation to them is that it helps to think about this nucleus just as being gone from the cell. Um, so just picture this particular nucleus out of the cell. So just get rid of this in your mind, all right? What's left, right? So this portion is left. And what does that look like? Does that look like a lymphocyte cytoplasm? Absolutely not, it does not. Um, the cytoplasm looks just like these red blood cells, right? So this is a red blood cell here. These are red blood cells. These are red blood cells. It looks like very similar color to these cells, right? It does not look like a lymphocyte cytoplasm. Um, so um, this is a nucleated red. So that's uh, a good tip, hopefully, uh, for you to know the difference because this is a very common problem, students getting these confused with lymphs. The next phase of the red blood cell maturation process is the polychromatic erythrocyte. These are also referred to as reticulocytes or retics. So once the cell becomes a retic, it enters into the peripheral bloodstream through the sinuses within the bone marrow. It continues to mature in the peripheral blood for around one day until it matures into a fully mature erythrocyte or red blood cell. Retics account for about 0.5 to 2.5% of all the red blood cells within the peripheral blood. So a small amount seen while doing a blood cell differential is, is considered normal. With the right Giemsa stain, which is the stain that we use for doing blood cell differentials, retics appear like mature red blood cells, except that they are a little larger and they stain kind of a fainter purple color. So when they are seen in right Giemsa stain blood cell differentials, we refer to it as polychromasia. So this is a retic. This is a retic, this is a retic. I'll try to circle as many as I can find. These are retics, it's a retic. All these are retics. So you can see in comparison to other red blood cells, they're a little bit larger and they're just slightly different color. They're a slightly uh, more purple color than the normal red uh, mature uh, red blood cells. So recall on the photo on the last slide, uh, when polychromatic erythrocytes are seen in a right Giemsa stain blood cell differential, we refer to it as polychromasia. We can do a separate uh, stain, uh, which is called the new methylene blue stain, to visually see the reticulocytes. New methylene blue is called a supervital stain, and supervital stains are those that stain living material. The reticulocyte count is based on the property of ribosomal RNA to react with isotonic solutions of the new methylene blue stain. So this photo here is a photo of what retics look like when stained with new methylene blue stain. The little dots in these cells are the residual ribosomal DNA that's left over. Uh, it used to be that to get a reticulocyte count on a patient, uh, laboratory professionals had to do a super vital stain and a manual reticulocyte count. Advancements in laboratory equipment have uh, started to phase this test out and retic counts are often performed on an automated cell counting analyzer. So the polychromatic erythrocytes or reticulocytes are pushed into the peripheral blood from the bone marrow and in about a day of being in the peripheral blood, they mature into a mature erythrocyte. So this is what we call mature red blood cells. And red blood cells are bioconcave discs 
So this shape pr provides an increased surface area through which more gases can diffuse and thus be transported. Uh, the plasma membrane of the red blood cell um, is strong and flexible, which allows them to bend and squeeze through narrow capillaries without lysing or breaking apart. And uh, they live around 120 days in the peripheral blood, uh, the peripheral bloodstream. So this picture on the right-hand side shows you what uh, red blood cells look like in a uh, red gene sustain. Uh, so uh, a manual differential is what we'd be seeing these in. So we've talked about all of the cells in the erythrocyte maturation cycle. And as I was doing this, I kind of remembered um, as a student myself being a little bit confused about what cells are normal and which cells are abnormal. So I'm going to try to break it down for you a little bit here. So all of these cells, so from the pronormoblast stage, basophilic normoblast, polychromatophilic normoblast, and orthochromic normoblast, and even uh, reticulocytes as well. Um, so all of these are normal cells in the bone marrow, all right? So they are created in the bone marrow and mature in the bone marrow. And then once they are matured, so at this reticulocyte stage here, um, then they are pushed from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood. So mature red blood cells, so here, mature red blood cells, and some reticulocytes, all right? Um, so when I say some, I mean, so less than 2.5% of all red blood cells are reticulocytes, um, are normal in the peripheral blood. So when you're performing a manual cell differential on a patient, you should only be seeing mature erythrocytes and a small percentage of reticulocytes. So less than 2.5% of them should be retics. So now these other cells from the pronormoblast stage to the orthochromic normoblast stage can be prematurely pushed out of the bone marrow, and you can see them in the peripheral blood doing a manual differential. But this is an abnormal clinical situation, and the degree and severity of abnormality varies. So you can see um, orthochromic normoblasts, also called nucleated red blood cells, in newborn babies, uh, for example, from the stress of being born. Um, you can also see them in, uh, for example, patients that have sickle cell anemia. So in general, the more immature cells that you see in the peripheral bloodstream, the worse the situation is. So if you're seeing pronormoblasts, which recall as an MLS or MLT, we would just refer to these as blast cells. Uh, that indicates a cancerous process. So hopefully the synopsis kind of helps you a little bit here. So let's talk a little bit about red blood cells. So newborns have the highest concentration of red blood cells, and that concentration gradually decreases until the baby is around two to three months of age. By the time the pregnant mother's blood reaches the placenta, there's just a lower concentration of oxygen present within the blood. So in utero, this causes a really hypoxic state, meaning that there are lower levels of oxygen. And this hypoxic state um, causes an increased level of erythropoietin or EPO. And we, as you remember from uh, the beginning of this presentation, this EPO uh, stimulates the production of red blood cells. So additionally, fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen, meaning it binds the oxygen more strongly than adult hemoglobin. So all of this allows the baby to survive in utero in that hypoxic state. So this is why when the baby is born, they have a higher red blood cell count than a normal adult. So reference ranges uh, for men, uh, male patients, are five times 10 to the 12th per liter red blood cells. And adult women patients, red blood cells should be 4.5 times 10 to the, uh, the uh, 12th per liter. So men have a bit more uh, red blood cell count uh, in general due to their testosterone levels, uh, which testosterone also stimulates EPO, which in turn uh, stimulates the production of more red blood cells. Around 1-2% to 2 of red blood cells are destroyed by the spleen every day. And this is a normal process. It's called extravascular hemolysis. So the body is just constantly producing red blood cells to replenish the old red blood cells that are dying and get destroyed. Increased production can be triggered by a decrease of intracellular oxygen tension or a decrease in oxygen transport to the tissues. So the body will need more oxygen in these situations, so it will produce more red blood cells to compensate. So these types of things can occur in anemia, uh, which there is, and which there is a decrease of red blood cells due to a variety of reasons. Um, higher altitude climates, and also in patients with cardiac and pulmonary disorders. 
We discussed on the previous slide about extravascular hemolysis. So again, red blood cells live in the peripheral bloodstream around 120 days. And when they become senescent and die, they are removed from the peripheral blood by macrophages in the spleen and liver. The hemoglobin within the red blood cell is broken down into heme and globin. The heme part of that is metabolized or broken down to bilirubin in the macrophage. The globin part of that hemoglobin molecule is metabolized into amino acids. We'll discuss bilirubin a lot in clinical chemistry, um, but in broad summation, uh, bilirubin is created from the heme being broken down. So initially it's unconjugated, meaning it isn't bound to anything. So this unconjugated bilirubin is excreted into the patient's plasma and then carried to the liver. It then binds in the liver, becoming something that we call conjugated bilirubin. And this conjugated form is excreted in bile. And while in this bile, the conjugated bilirubin is then taken to the upper GI tract. It's then metabolized in that upper GI tract to urobilinogen, and the urobilinogen is excreted from the body in both stool and urine. So a normal amount of bilirubin is present in the blood as this is caused from those red blood cells dying at the end of their lifespan. And again, we'll talk much more about this in-depth uh, process in clinical chemistry. Intravascular hemolysis, meaning the lysis or breaking of the red blood cells that is happening within the circulation, uh, dumping the released hemoglobin into the peripheral blood. It accounts for 5 to 10 percent of the red blood cells destruction. Now, increased intravascular hemolysis results in an increased indirect or unconjugated bilirubin in the blood and also an increase of iron, reticulocytes, and something we call lactate dehydrogenase or LD. LD is present within the blood cells, so when they break open or lyse, that LD spills out into the bloodstream. Same with iron. And reticulocytes are immature red blood cells. So when premature intravascular hemolysis is happening, the body works in overdrive to produce more red blood cells to replenish the supplies, and in doing so, throws out a lot of retics into the bloodstream to eventually become uh, mature red blood cells. So that concludes the lecture on erythrocytes. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a like, and please make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. Until next time.